This is CUNY TV, the City University of New York. Welcome to the American Theatre Wing seminars on working in the theatre. These seminars are coming to you from the Graduate Center at the City University of New York, which is located on 42nd Street, the heart of Times Square, heart of the theater district, the heart of New York, and where Broadway and off-off-Broadway and off-Broadway all meet to bring the magic of live theater. The American Theater Wing is perhaps best known for its Tony Awards, but it is more than that. It is one of the oldest year-round organizations devoted to giving to the community through the theater the magic of theater. Everything that we do speaks of that. We send live theater to hospitals. We bring live theater to schools on Saturday morning so that children will get the habit of going to the theater, so that children will need to go to the theater as part of their lives, not just for an anniversary or for a birthday or for a big occasion. They will go to the theater. They will learn to go to the theater, and it will stay with them. We've already found out that this happens. And so we, through our Saturday Theater for Children program, send as much theater as we possibly can through the five boroughs of New York. We also have these seminars, and the seminars are an outgrowth of the Wing School. After the Second World War, returning veterans came to the school and rehoned their trade. They were able to learn from directors and producers and performers and playwrights. They went from one room to another. When the school closed, these seminars took its place. And so coming to you now from the Graduate Center of the City of New York is the seminar on playwright director. It is a wonderful seminar. It's a wonderful panel that we have. And I will turn it over to Jean Dalrymple, who is a founding member of, of the American Theatre Wing, our, one of our most loyal directors of the board, and uh, George White, who is president of the Eugene O'Neill <coughs> Foundation or Theatre Center in Connecticut. Eugene O'Neill has perhaps done so much this year. It's his 100th anniversary, his 100th birthday. And so we're all talking about it, and it's nice to have George White here as co-moderator. George, would you take over? Thank you, Isabel. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here and to introduce uh, my side of the panel, if you will. Um, and it will start on my far right uh, with Philip Hayes Dean, uh, who is, uh, whose recent play, Paul Robeson, uh, has been done on Broadway and is noted for many other plays, including uh, Black Noel and uh, the uh, American, American Dixieland Band. Uh, to his left, is um, playwright Michael Weller, who has uh, a new play running on Broadway, now The Spoils of War, which we will get into in some detail, I hope, coming up, uh, and is also noted for, uh, among many other plays, uh, Moon Children. To my immediate right is Robert Allen Ackerman, who is the current director of Legs Diamond, running on Broadway, and is a resident director of the New York Shakespeare Festival. Jean? On my side, uh, I have at my far left uh, Harold Scott, who's the director of Paul Robeson, the wonderful show now on Broadway. He's also affiliated with the O'Neill Theater Center and the Cincinnati Playhouse in the Park. And next to him is an old favorite of mine, who I love as an actor, but is right now that the director of Spoils of War, which is the play on Broadway, and we had its star yesterday here on the panel. And uh, next to him is Alan Johnson, choreographer of Legs Diamond, which, as you heard, is, is on Broadway. It's now in uh, previews, but will soon open. And we have a theater party for it, by the way, with 200 seats to sell in case anybody wants to. <laughs> <laughs> And right here is wonderful Harvey Feierstein, who wrote the book for Legs Diamond, soon to be on Broadway <laughs> opening. He also wrote the book for La Cajo Fall. And I'm sure you all saw that wonderful show. And I think that we will start 
asking everybody, and uh, let me see, we might start with uh, Austin. Uh, how did you begin in this ridiculous business of ours? <laughs> As an actor, yeah. uh, doing a play off Broadway 26 years ago called Oh Dad, Poor Dad, Mama's Hung You in the Closet and I'm Feeling So Sad, <laughs> yeah. um, which I was extremely lucky to get because it ran for a year. And, uh, uh, and I got that by not quite a fluke, but I got the audition by a fluke, and then I, I, I did about six <coughs> auditions for it uh, three or four months after I came to New York. That's a very atypical story and must not be taken seriously <laughs> by anyone. And, uh, um, but they couldn't find at all what they wanted. There was a very specific thing they wanted. <laughs> And uh, they couldn't find it, so, so it was as a result of that that I even got an audition for it, which otherwise I wouldn't have done. And that's how I got started. And I got started as a director at the Williamstown Theatre Festival, where I'd been an apprentice and where I was acting in the equity company, and the, artist, uh, the artistic director there, Nikos, said, why don't you direct something this summer? Obeying a thoughtless but innocent impulse, he said that. And uh, so I did. And uh, then I started to direct there every couple of years. And uh, then that began to lead to other directing jobs. Very good. And Mr. Scott, would you like to tell how you began? Sure. I uh, began as an actor also uh, 30 years ago in a play called Perhaps Death Watch with George Maharis and Vic Morrow, uh, which has a, uh, another story behind it, which is not to be taken seriously. Um, I did the play at Harvard in my senior year, and it was taken to the Yale Drama Festival, where it won uh, every prize it could and was viewed by Star Kesseltine, who was a beginning agent at that time, and uh, the director, Leo Garin, of the New York production of Death Watch. They saw me at Yale in that and asked me to do the role in New York. Um, which, of course, I said happily yes to, uh, and did it and won the OB for my first New York role. Uh, then went on and acted for the next 15 years until while I was in The Boys in the Band, Sarah O'Connor, who was then the manager of the theater company of Boston, called me and said, how would you like to direct The Blacks, which I had also been in in New York for ever, uh, at least two years, seems like 10. Um, and I asked Richard Barr for a leave of absence to go to Boston to direct The Blacks, and did, and enjoyed the experience immensely. And about this same time, I was having difficulty getting acting jobs because of my complexion. The Black Revolution was at its peak, and you literally had to be dark complexioned in order to work at that time. So I stopped working post haste, having worked constantly. <laughs> and uh, having then begun to direct and having another outlet, continued to direct and was, while I was directing at the Lobe, uh, which is where I did the Blacks, I was asked back to do the birthday party in Waiting for Godot. And while I was doing Waiting for Godot, <laughs> Lloyd and George asked me to come to the O'Neill to act again. <laughs> Uh, so I happily went, but somewhat confused as to which role I was going to end up taking in this life. Uh, and after two years of acting there, they asked me to direct there. And so I shifted to directing there and have continued directing ever since. And now I'm head of the directing program, the professional directing program at Rutgers Mason Gross School of the Arts in New Brunswick. Phil, you have both been a... Uh writer and a director. Is there some acting in your background too? Oh, yes. How did you get it? <laughs> I'm sure there is. Well, I that was a loaded off. question. I did that on purpose. I started off as an actor at the Willoway Playhouse in Michigan um, a very long time ago. And I then came to New York expecting Kazan to meet me at the railroad station <laughs> saying, we're glad to have you. But he wasn't there. So I finally was studying with Herbert Berghoff, and they decided to do a black version of Waiting for Godot. So I was cast as lucky, and I must have lost seven or eight jobs. There was a producer named Michael Meyerberg, and he would say, Kid, come up Tuesday. 
and I would quit my job thinking I was going to sign my contract. I never did. And finally, because I knew the part so well, they took Jeffrey Holder because the Calypso craze had just come in, and he had come in on that. So they made him the, um, gave him the part and made me the standby. At that time, you had to be uh, an understudy and assistant stage manager. But he had a contract to dance with the Mets, so he could only open in the play, so he always got the reviews. <laughs> and then I would take over the role and do it. <laughs> then I decided, well, if he could walk off the street and become an actor, why should I keep acting? So I started to write. <laughs> and uh, the first play I wrote, I gave it to Diana Sands. She read it and gave it to someone else, and they were producing it before I found out about it. I even had to pay to get in to see it. <laughs> <laughs> so then I didn't write for a while. I spent the rest of my time sitting in the village, doing what people used to do in the village at that time, which was nothing. <laughs> and I wrote another play called Sty of the Blind Pig, and I gave it to Francis Foster to read. And they did a workshop of it at the actor's studio. And I was off at the University of Michigan teaching, and the next thing I knew, they were doing it. <laughs> I didn't have to pay that time to get it. <laughs> free. And that's how I started writing. Uh, Michael, uh, apart from doing gigs on cruise ships, which you just told me about, uh, <laughs> which you could explain, perhaps, uh, tell me about your start, because I know that your credits go quite far and long and deep. Um, well, I, uh, <clears throat> I started right. I started as a composer, and um, this, this, I was in college at the time. So uh, I, st I, I hooked up with a group that, that at my school, which was Brandeis, was a little like the Harvard's uh, Hasty Pudding Club, except that because it was Brandeis and we were all very serious and Jewish, it was, it, it was, it was the, the, the things we produced were, were quite obscure and deep and all that. But they were, every year we did a, an a, original musical. And uh, I, I, one year, I, com I composed the score for an adaptation of a Nathaniel West novel called A Cool Million. And um, <clears throat> it was a kind of interesting evening. But I, I decided at the end it didn't work because somehow the book wasn't as good as my music was. So I decided that what I'd do is, is, learn, is try to figure out how to write a play. And then I would write a play and the music to it. And then it would all have a unity to it. And then I would give the the script to, to an actual writer who would, who would make it into an actual play, but it would have my feeling and my idea behind it. So I, I found a book in a store called How to Write a Play, or Playwriting Made Easy is what it was. It was one of those, there's a whole series, it's like Swahili Made Easy, Plumbing Made Easy, it was like one of them, and they come in a blue and a yellow and a blue cover, you know, the, and it had a lot of very simple down-to-earth hints about playwriting, which is the kind of thing I like to you know, like to see. And it, it was, there was nothing fancy about it. It was all just sort of bread and butter advice. And I was working in a, a bar at the time as a, as a sort of waiter and a barman. And I used to just read this thing and steal napkins and make notes on it. I, there was a big <laughs> game between me and Stewie, the bartender. He would sort of move the napkins over where I couldn't get to them. <laughs> I'd pull them back and make notes. And um, finally, it, one of the pieces of advice that this, this book had in it that I found useful was, don't start with your own plot. Find, find a book or, or a, you know, a, a ready-made plot that won't demand of you um, that extra thing of making up a story of your own. So uh, I thought that's, that's good advice since I didn't have an idea in the world anyway. So. And I uh, found a book called Malcolm by James Purdy um, a few years before uh, another playwright found it and uh, made, it, made it into a musical. We didn't have the rights, so we called it Fred. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, we, we, and, and I, I wrote the book to it and gave it to the High Charlie Society, and they said, great, we'll do it, but you can't write the music, because that would be nepotistic, and we need new blood in High Charlie. So, um, you know, I, I took, I'd followed the path of least resistance. They, they seemed to like my writing, and I was a terrible composer anyway. And uh, from then on, it just uh, went forward. I just enjoyed it a lot, and I seemed to have a knack for it. Mainly, I just enjoyed it a lot. And also, I could carry a pad with me wherever I went and just write anywhere, as opposed to carrying a piano around with me anywhere. <laughs> it just seemed a more mobile and, and, and pleasant and congenial way to, 
to spend my days. To return to my side, may I now ask Alan Johnson to speak to us? Well, I got started as a dancer on Broadway. When I was um, a kid, I fell in love with musical movies, like most of us, I'm sure. And when I was about 16, I saw uh, my first Broadway musical, Out of Town in Philadelphia. And I went, my God, they do all this live on, on stage. I, that's what I want. So I went to New York and became a dancer and danced in about six or seven shows. And at a certain point, uh, I decided, I think I can do that, what the choreographers had been doing that I worked for. So I tried in summer stock, and I wasn't very good, and I wasn't very happy. Uh, I had done a few things. And then um, Mel Brooks I knew socially. And um, he was about to do a movie called The Producers. And he had uh, a choreographer lined up for it. And he said, what do you think of this choreographer? I said, I think he's great. He's, he's, and it, it took a long time to get this movie on. So he said, look, if anything happens to the choreographer, I'm going to ask you to do it. And I said, Mel, it's your first movie. Don't, don't be nice to friends. Get the best you can. He said, no, I know how you think of it. I know you'll be right for it. So that was the first time I had like a dance arranger and the ideas, and it was all mine. I simply wasn't recreating somebody else's work in summer stock. And that's how I became a choreographer. Tell them a little about the film, because it's very famous. It is, in, in the number. Yes. Uh, yeah, there's a, a, a number that's uh, sort of notorious uh, <laughs> called Springtime for Hitler. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and the reason it's so good is the whole movie builds to it. Um, these two producers are out to produce the worst show in the world and over-invest in it and run away to Brazil when it's a flop. They want it to be a flop so they don't have to pay anybody back. And this number is supposed to make it a flop along with other things, and it does. <laughs> Take it. Uh, Bob, uh, how did you first have these feelings of... <laughs> <laughs> strange. Yeah, they're right. Yeah. Rather strange feelings. Well, I grew up... Um, at a hotel in the um, Catskills, the uh, New Jersey version of the Catskills, um, sort of a Borscht Belt hotel called Ackerman's. Um, my grandparents owned it. And um, every summer I would get all the kids together and we would do the latest uh, big hit Broadway musical in a rather scaled down version. My father would buy us the scripts from um, the uh, drama book shop and the parents would make the costumes and the kids would paint the scenery <laughs> and I would direct these shows and I grew up always dreaming about being in the theater but always thinking it was something very very remote and then when I got out of school I immediately became a teacher and I taught for many years until I just felt like enough I really want to be in the theater and I'm gonna give it a try and I bought a copy of Backstage and I saw an ad for um, an acting job open in an off-off-Broadway company called CSC. At that time, off-off-Broadway was just starting. And I went for the audition, and I got the part. And the nucleus of that company formed its own company called the New Repertory Company. And we needed directors. And I had only directed these <laughs> things at Ackerman's. <laughs> but, um, I said, well, I'd like to give it a shot. And I directed a play that got very, very good reviews. And so I decided, well, I'm better at this than I am at acting. I'll just direct another one. And eventually I got, my work was seen by Kermit Bloomgarten. And Kermit, um, who was a wonderful producer, uh, who's no longer alive, um, picked up a show that I had done with this company and produced it off-Broadway. And so I all of a sudden officially was a professional director. And from that I got a job uh, directing in Texas and Lloyd Richards saw the show that I directed there and asked me to come to the O'Neill. And the very first play that I directed at the O'Neill was a play called A Prayer for My Daughter 
Um, and Joe Papp happened to see it and asked me to do it in New York. And um, I won an Obie Award for it. And then I was asked to do Bent on Broadway. And so one thing just led to another. And so forth and so on. <laughs> and so forth and so on, right. Yeah. So now we come to Harvey Forestine. And he has done so many wonderful things. Tell us about the first one. Well, and then go on. <laughs> <laughs> I was a freshman at the High School of Art and Design. And um, a friend of mine's mother was starting a community theater group in, um, in Brooklyn. And they asked us to do uh, the posters. So we went and sat in a church basement and did the posters for this first show um, and got very high on the magic markers, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and when we were high enough, they asked us if we would run the show. <laughs> and I said, okay, I'll pull a curtain. I mean, I had no interest in theater other than as a, as a kid, we went every Saturday to a matinee. Um, and I liked the theater, but I had no bug or anything. So we, uh, anyway, I pulled the curtains on the first show that this community theater did, and the second show was to be um, Our Town. And you know, it has those two newsboys. And uh, my friend wanted to audition, but he was scared to audition alone, so he said, well, you come and audition too, because you'll be worse than me and I won't feel so bad. <laughs> and only I got the role. Um, and then the next show, that uh, we did some more, and then all of a sudden I was doing I was like 16 years old and I was playing the telephone man in Barefoot in the Park and they had a paint stubble on so I would look older. Um, and some stupid reviewer came from Manhattan um, from Showbiz or backstage, one of those, and liked me. And um, that really messed up my life. Because <laughs> <coughs> in that same issue was an audition for Andy Warhol for his very first play and I was an art student and so to get to meet Andy Warhol, I would even act. Um, so I went down to this place called La Mama, which I'd never heard of before. Um, I lived way down in Brooklyn. Um, <laughs> and um, showed up and I weighed about 250 pounds and was very young. And um, they, put me, they put me in a dress and uh, the rest is history. <laughs> I started, uh, I started writing because there were all these, these great off-off-Broadway writers that were writing for me, Ronald Tavell and H.M. Katukas and Donald L. Brooks, and, and uh, I wanted to sort of do for them what they'd done for me, so I wrote a thing called In Search of the Cobra Jewels, uh, which was my, also my first musical. Um, I've never done lyrics again, <laughs> but uh, that's how I started writing. Uh, the Village Voice called me the devil come to earth after that opened. I figured I was on the right track. <laughs> In fact, I think the critic who reviewed that went heterosexual soon after seeing the show. So, <laughs> so, so I knew the pen was mightier than several other things. <laughs> Uh, let's see, I, I, I hear the rumble or the, the background of a lot of musical background in all of this, even though we are, you know, talking about the t two sides of things. Um, uh, I had not realized, that, Michael, that you had been a composer as well. Uh, and I wonder if, uh, for instance, just to throw this up in the air, uh, if whether or not the fact that when one, when the playwrights write, whether music in terms of what you um, are writing, if, if there's something deep down that, that has, that music is a tremendous factor in how, you know, you write. Phil, you do too, I know, have that, that sense of music. Is that, does that create a kind of, uh, I want to say, an obligato underneath your writing? Do you, do you feel that when you write? Uh, uh, you know, only in this way is that, I don't know about you, Philip, but I, I mean, I, I don't see the words on the page. You know, I, I mean, I'm, I can't spell to save my life. I don't, I don't actually see sentences when I'm working. I hear the lines. I hear them being spoken, and then I just copy them down. So I work, I, I work out of my ear more than I work, say, out of grammar or, or sentences or anything like that. And in that, I suppose that's musical. Does anyone else work that way? I do pretty much. I always think of myself when I write 
as eavesdropping on the characters, like I'm somewhere passing by and they're talking inside and I'm nosy mm -hmm. and eavesdrop on them. I don't, I don't know how anybody else writes, but I particularly, because I think a play is closer to music yes. than anything else, uh, particularly in the black theater where I think we are beginning to approach trying to find a way of bringing jazz into the work rather than following the European classical form. You uh, always have great rhythm in the writing. Yes. And all of the black writing is but very we have rhythmic. Rhythm. <laughs> 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 Harvey, uh, if I may, excuse me. Sure. Um, of course, now you're combining uh, and, and have uh, written musicals. How does that, for, for all of us, how does that work in terms of getting the mesh or not getting the mesh between the book and the music and all of those things that go back, you know, like for, for centuries yeah. in terms of problems or not? Are I, they? I had written one piece that was without music that was a musical, which was Fugue in a Nursery, the center play of, of Tort Song. That was, I mean, I wrote a fugue for four people. Um, but then when I sat down with uh, two people that one does not lightly sit down with, Arthur Lawrence and Jerry Herman, to write um, La Cage, I learned several great lessons, um, and also to never leave the room. Um, <laughs> uh, the first is that the music must be served. Uh, the music is it. You can, even in the hall, we commented that uh, when we were writing La Cage, I was so thrilled that I finally got up to the moment where I could write the speech for Alban, the drag queen, to stand there and say, you know, get the hell out of my way. This is my life, and I'm going to run it, and I'm proud of myself and all that. And I wrote this gorgeous speech, and I came in the next morning to our meeting, and I read it to them, and Arthur and Jerry both sat there wiping tears from their eyes, and I showed up for the next morning's meeting. And, of course, it was cut. It was a song now. <laughs> it became I am what I am because the music must be served. Um, several other lessons of writing that aren't the happiest. Um, you cannot speak more wittily than you sing. <laughs> so either get the best lyrics writer you can, or don't try and write jokes. Um, I mean, lots of things. Uh, the people don't understand in a musical that the book is not just the spoken word, mm -hmm. but it's the whole structure of the show. It's if a character lands, it's because the book put the character there to land. If a song lands, it's because the book set it up right. Um, the spoken word in a musical is less important. When you say Robert, I mean, we've been working together now, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the whole um, effort of working on a musical is so much bigger. What Harvey is talking about, structure, in a play, I, this is the first large musical that I've ever directed, the first large original musical that I've ever directed, and it's, uh, it's a bit overwhelming at times because um, when you're working on a play, you are ve very much focused on the whole, but through very small detail, and always more or less searching for a truth, whereas when you're working on a musical, you're always looking at a larger structure and, and not finding a truth necessarily but finding something that works something that um, gets an immediate audience response and every time you go in to examine a moment in a play it, it can be a very private thing you might call one actor in for a rehearsal with the writer and maybe change a few lines and then rehearse it and see how it fits in. Every time there's a change to make in a musical, you have to call in the stage manager, the set designer, the costume designer, the lighting designer. It affects so many areas. You're, it, it's such a larger, um, larger piece of work. How did you learn these tools that you're talking about? You all came to it mostly through acting. And then you became a director, you became a playwright. Where did you learn the fundamental things that you're discussing now, which are very important? Well, Is I that come from, from off-off Broadway. I mean, I come from doing things in Bastianos and La Mama and Theater for the New City. And um, so I learned by, by doing. 
um, I wrote In Search of the Cobra Jewels, then something called f uh, Freaky Pussy, excuse the expression. Um, <laughs> but it was the 70s. Um, <laughs> flat, Flatbush Tosca, and then I, and then I first you know, wrote uh, what became the first play of, of the Tort Song Trilogy, um, International Stud. So, I mean, I had that. And as far as acting, I'd, I'd acted in 60 some odd plays before I wrote anything myself. So you sort of learn that way. Michael can tell you, I used to run into him and yell at him, when was he going to write a decent role for me? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's interesting that you had confidence enough as a playwright to give your play to a director who said, I think I can do this. I'd seen your work off Broadway or off off Broadway. Where does that where does that feeling of confidence come from? Hmm? To direct? Oh, to direct. Mm -hmm. To direct oh God, your play. I don't know that you ever have a feeling of confidence. You just bite the bullet and go. Uh, I, but in terms of how we come about it, uh, both Austin and I have were trained together at, in the original company at Lincoln Center with uh, Bobby Lewis and Paul Mann and Anna Sokolow as the teachers, and uh, Ilya Kazan being the founder of the, uh, of the group. And uh, I know all during that training period, they used to periodically say to me, and I suspect they said to Austin, I mean, this, this, our fellow students, uh, Faye Dunaway, Patricia Rowe, uh, oh God, there were so many, uh, you ought to direct. And I never knew what that meant. Uh, at the time, I suppose, I got paranoid about it and thought, what do you mean I can't act? <laughs> so, um, <laughs> you thought that too? Yeah. <laughs> but it's interesting that both of us then went on to act and then did become directors. Um, and I think that during the period that I was with the company, I was directed by Kazan, by Harold Klorman, by Quintero. And so I was directed by masters, and uh, I watched them like hawks uh, and learned a great deal. And I think that was where my initial training came from watching them and being directed by them. And then subsequently, the uh, six years that I spent at the O'Neill uh, were the rest of my training, because that's a trial by fire when you have to have a play on its feet in 21 hours of rehearsal. I mean, you best know what you're doing and bite the bullet and go, whether you know what you're doing or not, and pray God you do. Um, but I, I, the, the, the idea of having the acting background and directing the actor rather than just directing the script, I have always found to be most satisfying to me. In fact, I prefer to be directed by directors who have acted because they can help me if I get stuck. Uh, a director, uh, well, not to say that a director who hasn't acted can't, but I have had many a situation where you get stuck and the director can't get you forward, and that's an awful situation. So now that I teach directing, I certainly try to make sure that my students study acting as well. How does one teach directing? <laughs> Very good question. <laughs> Very slowly. <laughs> and pretty much one at a time. It's a one-on-one -on -one experience. I have seven of my students, all seven of them, uh, here now. That's seven over a three-year span. And I usually begin with three or four and end up with one or two. It's a, it's a <laughs> high rate of attrition. Um, and it, it's pretty much a one-on-one -on -one experience. You, you, give them things to direct, and then you go in and supervise and manipulate. And uh, There are also principles that you teach them that you've learned over the years. Do you call a group of actors for them to direct? Well, there's an acting training. Yes, Bill Esper heads the acting training program, so there's a constant pool of actors to work with, which is the only way to learn directing. You can't, I don't feel you can learn directing without a pool of actors to no, direct. I shouldn't think so. I don't think you can learn it from a book. <laughs> exactly. Go read a book. Well, actually, isn't it? It is true that, that directing itself is, uh, is, is, comes rather late in the history of theater. Yes. That, that uh, you know, actors sort of made sure they didn't bump into each other and worked it out. Uh, and the whole uh, cult of the director is <coughs> rather late. That's thing. what Zero Mostel used to say when we were in Fiddler. He'd say, you know, the director is a 20th century invention. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's right. Yeah, yeah, he was. Yeah. 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 Sure. But then the senior actor always serves as some sort of director. I mean, he's the always the actor manager. Yes. Uh, no, I mean even before, before that, that mm. Uh, mm. there's always been somebody who functioned as a uh, director. Probably started as a stage manager of some kind and evolved. 
I think it's evolved too much, but that's another. Well, there, there's, a, there's a quick, there's a famous story of Edith Evans uh, uh, when uh, when Tony Richardson walked into a production, and uh, yet again another production of of importance of being earnest, and he walked into the rehearsal room about ten minutes late, and Edith uh, Evans was moving around and telling everybody where to go and what to do, and he said, <coughs> "Excuse me, Dame Edith, how do you? I'm Tony Richardson. I'm your." Uh, Director, and she said, "Oh, how nice! We'll sit over there, and we'll be with you in about a half hour." But that's another—that's the master yeah. actor. Uh, I, if I may, I wanted to ask uh, Alan, how does the choreographer fit into the 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 directorial business? Obviously, you must have to have a, a very close working relationship together to make all of this work. And how yeah. does, I think for a lot of people, be interested to know how that melds or doesn't? Well, hopefully you, uh, you take the character from one point to another. Uh, you move the plot along somewhat while you're entertaining the people. Uh, and in this show, it seems like we have a lot of plot numbers. Uh, it's heavily involved in plot. Um, but you just don't want to get out there and dance for five minutes about nothing. I mean, I find that the hardest job in the world. Give me a clue. Give me a hint of where I should go, what I should use. Um, otherwise, it's, and you see a lot of it, television does that, a lot of empty dancing. There are people moving in the background. It's scenery, you know, moving scenery. It should mean something. It could, should communicate something to the audience about the character or the people involved in dance. So it is a very close kind of collaboration uh, between the writer, the director, and the choreographer, when it works. Yeah. But it's, uh, it, it's always delightful when the choreographer actually gets a beautiful picture together, and then it goes into a dance and goes back to the picture. Hmm. I like that very much. All right, I'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> Put one of those numbers in for Gene. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it pleases me very much. <laughs> the performers uh, often talk about directors and uh, the different types of directors. The director that lets the performer emerge from the character and bring to the character what he or she feels that should be right. Or there is then the director, as one of the performers said, you must move just seven and a half inches to your left or seven and a half inches to your right. And, no more. Could we talk about what kind of directors you are? are I'm you definitely the former, the actor's director. I, I believe it's an organic process where you collaborate with the actor, mm -hmm. and the performance evolves under your tutelage. I, when I performed, I hated uh, being just told where to go and what to do and to lift an eyebrow or cross a leg. <coughs> uh, I, I, uh, felt, I found that stifling. Um, I know there are other actors who prefer give me my marks, tell me where to go and what to do, and I'll fill it out later. Um, I tend to think of that as being an older school of acting, uh, that the contemporary actor prefers to be given the leeway, the space to have the role evolve so that he feels that he's collaborated in something rather than just then been told where to go and what to do and why to do in, it that in way. the actor. The actor. Mm -hmm. Austin, how do you feel? Pretty much the same as how I'm, I'm a little... <clears throat> confused about it. Uh, actually, as may be true of other people too, I mean my idol as a director when I was growing up, before I ever thought I would, I never even thought of being a director until I'd been acting for some years, but my idol was Kazan, and um, who didn't meet my train either, you know, but, but, no, uh, no, no. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, and, and the, um, but, um, and it was, it was extremely instructive for me to read his autobiography this um, year, which I recommend to anyone who's interested in the theater at all, or in anything else, actually, but, but the, but, uh, um, the, um, I'd heard a story a long time ago when I first started to direct, about Kazan directing. Now, I don't know, it may be apocryphal, but I don't think it is. It seems consistent with everything I know about him. Uh, that when he was directing the superb film of Streetcar Named Desire that he did, that he worked one way with Marlon Brando and another way with uh, Vivian Lee. 
he worked with her as, you know, extremely technically. Here you want to develop the pitch, here you want to build this and fall, make this fall and all that. And, and, and with Brando, he worked very internally. <coughs> and of course, what emerges from that is this tremendous kind of chemistry between them. But not because they were working the same way. It was because each of them felt completely released in their own terms, felt released and I guess you'd say honored in their own terms so they could be completely themselves as actors. And therefore they were able to bring to each other the peak of their, each of their particular artistries. And um, I was very struck by that. And when, when I heard that, and of course one sees the results, and, I, and, and so I've tried over the years, particularly in the last few years, to try to work a different way with every actor, even within the same cast, particularly sometimes within the same cast, and to completely honor all the differences between the people and to have the consistency become not a consistency of approach in the work, but a consistency of, of the fact of all these actors being brought to their own peaks, if possible. I, su I think sometimes that uh, a, a directing career consists of kind of looking back over every production you've directed and, and trying to determine which mistakes you made on that one. Because the rules change in every production. And there are a lot of performers in the past that I wished I'd worked with a different way. Then sometimes the opposite is true so from, from what I just said. Sometimes you say to yourself, no, I really should have tried to lead that actor into a, a, into a different way. But sometimes that's the right thing to do. Sometimes it's the wrong thing to do. Sometimes you, you, you figure out at the time what the right thing to do is, and sometimes you figure out later. Uh, but it's a very thorny question. Uh, sometimes as an actor, I, because I still act a lot, I've been, it's been terribly helpful to me that a director has said, no, Austin, don't do that stuff that you usually do and, and don't even approach it the same way. And they've made me work in a way that I, I don't, I would resist working. And sometimes that's been wonderful and then sometimes when a director has done that same thing to me, I think it's been very destructive. It's, the rules change every time. It also has to do a lot with where an actor is, and this is quite important, and this is sometimes an overlooked thing in what you hear, but anyone who's directed, I'm sure, has learned this. It, it depends a lot where an actor is at that moment in their work and in their lives. And in their training, too. In their I training, guess. but but uh, but assume their training. Assume that they're that they're that they're trained instruments. Uh, that that actors are at different moments in their lives and how their lives relate to their work. And there's sometimes the thing that they need to do is to go into a whole other kind of work. And sometimes the that's the last thing they should do. And you have to somehow intuit that. And a few times I've been pretty clumsy about that as a director. I've, I've, made, the, made, the, I've made the wrong moves, and sometimes I've made the right moves. But the, um, the, I think the worst thing you can do is, is sit a bunch of people down and insist that everyone work exactly the same way, because you're going to offend some of the people. You're going to speak like that. Oh, we all have to work the way he works or she works? You know, what's this? And I mean, you have to sort of hear where everyone is in their work, in their approach to the work, in their lives, what they need, what they don't need. Would you like to pick up mm -hmm. on that? Well, I'm in total agreement with Austin. In my experience, I've found that um, there's no, no two times when it's the same. Um, you're always confronting um, a new group of people, and you're always trying to um, figure out what these, these people need at this particular moment. And it seems to me that um, in, my own, in my own work, I have found that um, I can't rely on one system. Uh, or one approach or one technique because different people need different things to get to the hope for result. Um, you can, I, I have found very often in talking about work that you think that you've made some sort of, uh, reached some sort of an understanding only to find out the next day when you run a scene that no, 
there was a complete misunderstanding there. Um, so you really have to, um, one really has to evaluate the actors that you're working with and really try and understand what it is that they need and what language it is that they understand and what, what grounds there are for communication. I've been working, um, for the last few years, I've been living and working mostly in London. And I find working over there a completely different experience than working here. Actors there are much more interested in being told, okay, what do you want me to do here, 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 and here? And then fill it in themselves. Um, whereas actors in America are much more interested in starting at a sort of um, neutral Which spot. Which do you think is better? I don't think that there is one. I, I wouldn't say that either one is better than the other. I think it's very dependent on um, what the needs of the actor, what the needs of the actor is at that moment. And I've broken through that kind of work with English actors at times. And at times here, I've insisted that American actors get more disciplined and begin to think in, in the, those kind of technical terms. Is that true in choreography? No. <clears throat> no, I don't think so. In choreography, there is, <clears throat> in dance, there's a basic technique. I mean, it's all based on ballet. And <clears throat> then it's just various interpretations of it. And dancers, um, I suppose like actors, uh, have to give you every version of, every stylistic version of something that you ask for. That's the job. So uh, it, it's not a difficult job. Also, you can, you can uh, demonstrate and then have them imitate. It's nice if it has a little inner feeling along with it, but uh, uh, it's a much easier job than working with actors that way. Because of the basic technique that, uh -huh. <coughs> that we, everybody has. We have talked about the relation of the um, director to the actor and how to do that. Um, coming from the point of view of the playwright, um, how does that work? Of course, Phil and, and Michael, you've both uh, been involved in how that collaborative process works uh, or doesn't work with a, with a well, playwright. Well, that's plays the, I've, the plays of mine that have worked is where I've had no collaboration. Um, I don't believe in collaboration in the drama, in the theater I do. And I, I think there's always a danger, and I'm not talking about being stubborn or obstinate or something like that, but I think you have to be very careful as a playwright listening to directors and actors and the set designer and all these other people, and you have to go with your instinct, your feeling about something. And hopefully, one of the pleasant experience about Ropes in this time was that the play had already been written, and I didn't have to get involved with rewrites and discussing it with the director and the actor, and they took the script. The English have a marvelous thing. They say, if it ain't on the page, it ain't on the stage. <laughs> and uh, American directors seem to be under the impression that they are co-authors, and um, they are not. You know, and uh, I think playwrights in America, many of them have been ruined by listening to directors. And I think Kazan started it. And when lesser people than Kazan pulled it off, I can, you know the story of Cat. Yeah. And he goes into it in That's his book. Yes. Yeah. But it makes an interesting point, and I think it's a point well Every taken. Well, there were two different uh, endings to Cat. One that Tennessee Williams wrote, and then one that Kazan encouraged him to write. And I could see Kazan's point, uh, even though he kind of refutes it in the book. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that Kazan was doing that for a specific purpose, it w and that purpose was the Broadway audience. Okay. It wasn't coming out of his ego. Right. And that's the thing I th think you have to be very careful about, mm -hmm. that the director wants to substitute his ego for the playwright's ego. And I think that uh, that's dangerous. And I think we ought to stop this talk about process. I think a playwright should finish a play before he gives it to the director. I think where you get into trouble is when you have a play 
three quarters finished or something and give it to a director. And I think it opens it up to have the play destroyed Don't for you me. Think that the power of the film directors has influenced uh, the Yes, I think that a lot of directors, stage you know? directors who don't make it to the movies are trying to act out being movie directors. Yeah, that's what it seems to me. Michael is the editor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then comes the editor. Yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Where, where, where do you come from on this? Oh, I, I wanted to mention something about actors and directors. Okay. Uh, just a story that I heard that was so wonderful and illustrative. Because uh, th since the director is evolving as this unknown entity in a production now, and they never know quite how far they should participate and, and quite what their function is, it's still an evolving role. And uh, there was a story they used to tell in England about when, when uh, Brooke was directing Gilgood in Seneca's Oedipus. And he was working, he, uh, Brooke was starting to work in a very open kind of improvisatory way, which, which Kilgood hated. And uh, towards, uh, towards the end of rehearsals, uh, he, Brooke still hadn't said anything. He did, every time you went through it, you did it differently. And, and there was more and more panic setting in, in Gilgood, but he's much too much of a gentleman to say anything. And finally, Brooke said, look, I think something is getting a little stale about this, and I want you each one by one to come forward to the front of the stage and tell me the most terrifying thought you have. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody did this, at, you know, Olive Brooke. And finally, Gilgood <laughs> swept forward, and everybody's waiting in the wings. Right? And he said, we open in a week. <laughs> 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 well, I, uh, but about me and, and directors, uh, I don't, I don't have any rule about it, you know, except that that there's bad ones and good ones, and you, and I've mostly had, I mean, almost without exception, had very good directors. From my point of view, I, I, I agree with uh, with Philip that you've got to finish your play. I mean, in fact. My playwriting teacher, the one guy I studied with, said that what you do is you finish a play, uh, and then you put it in your drawer, and you rewrite it after two months. And then when it's all done, and you know you can do nothing more with it, you put it in your drawer again, and then you rewrite it again two months later. And then, when you know there's nothing you can do to improve it, then and only then, you put it in your drawer, and two months later, you take it out and rewrite it one more time. <laughs> and then by the time it reaches uh, a director, you're very sure of what, what you've done. And you don't feel that you're, that you're entering into one of these sort of like, the, here's some ideas, help me with it. I mean, you have the ultimate responsibility for the play. On the other hand, if you have a, a gifted director who's a, a fresh pair of eyes for you, um, I, I like it very much that I can, I can put myself uh, in... In, in a small way, in trust to them, and always following one rule, which is if, they, if what they sa say to me makes instant sense, if, if, if even the shadow of that thought has, has, has passed my heart at some point in the writing, but I didn't attend to it, then and only then I'll consider it. Otherwise, you just, you just uh, ignore it, and it's easy to do. I mean, you know, if the, if, if the director has a bad idea, you say no. <laughs> uh, it seems quite simple in that way. I think what can happen, uh, a little bit of this has been happening, very little, thank God, this time around, is that when you're on Broadway, the stakes are very high. And um, there are a lot of very uh, busy people, self-appointed experts, that will hover around you and want to help you improve your play. Now, you've got to remember that they don't know any more than you do. They're just guessing. And what they're guessing about is, is how to make this play be a moneymaker, basically. They're not really attending to what you're trying to say in the play. Uh, and that's the only editorial process you have to be very clear about with yourself. You select against their tendency to make what they think is going to be a Broadway hit. Now, if they knew it would be a Broadway hit, they'd be playwrights or directors, and they're not. So uh, you don't listen to them, that's all. Be nice to them, uh, buy them a drink, and then send them home, that's all. You mentioned a word which, is, which, uh, which I think uh, is, is, is critical here, I think for everyone, and, and uh, is the word trust. Uh, and uh, uh, for instance, I, and I wanted to bounce that over to you, Harvey, too, because you've had a, such an interesting career that evolved from, you know, from the La Mama days and the early days, which, which was a different way from a lot of other 
ways, you know, for instance, Austin or how I came to the theater. Uh, and where, and I do remember the, the era of the, you know, the, the middle and late 60s where everybody was learning a, a, a craft. But I wanted, maybe you could talk to the idea of trust or how you get to the balance of that. Will you trust, will you trust me that we'll all come back again? <laughs> we're, going to, we're going to have to take a break right now. And please don't go away. We're going to come back and have more questions and answers and continue on this very subject of trust, because I think that's what we're talking about. Even though you do not feel that you want a collaborator, I think there has to be a collaboration in the theater. And that, or trust, whichever word you want in to use. In the theater, not in the drama. <laughs> All right. We'll have to decide what the difference is then. Don't go away. We're going to take a break right now and just stretch, and we'll be right back. This is CUNY TV, the City University of New York. Welcome back to the American Theatre Wing Seminars on Working in the Theatre. These seminars are coming to you from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. And this panel are, is comprised of the playwright and the director. And before we took off just a few seconds ago, we were talking about collaboration and trust in the theatre. I'm going to ask Jean Dalrymple and George White, our co-chairpersons, to explore this and continue with the subject of trust in the theater. I don't know whether that's between producer, playwright, actor, or director. 
But right now, it is the playwright and the director that will talk about it. And I think Harvey should start that. All right. Well, Robert and I, uh, this is our third piece that we've worked on together. Uh, our first from scratch piece, though. Uh, Robert came in when I was doing uh, a play called Spook House and um, came in at the 11th hour to try and uh, pull it out of uh, where it ended up. Um, <laughs> but we realized working on that together how much we enjoyed working with each other and how much we did trust each other and I loved his ideas and he loved my ideas and we had a great time. It was just uh, too late. Um, Robert then was given the, the task of directing Torts Song Trilogy in London uh, with an all English cast and we prepared for that um, working together um, talking about it and all of that. And then when I went to London to take over for Anthony Sher, who had uh, played the role, Robert worked me into the show with an English company, uh, which was pretty bizarre. Because as he said, uh, English actors basically work a totally different way. So it was like I was doing the American version of the show, and they were doing the English version. And, <laughs> and, and none of us wanted to give. <laughs> um, though, we, though we loved each other, we had a wonderful time doing it. It still was like half in Italian and half in Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> they would just look at me constantly like, why is he doing that? Um, they were a bit bewildered. They were a little <laughs> bewildered by me. Um, <laughs> as I was by them, um, I thought I knew all those characters. Um, <laughs> and then Robert had been working on, on Legs, Diamond, and... and uh, for, and done a workshop of it all and asked me would I come in and, and help him out on that and, and so we started working together. Alan, uh, we had never known each other, Alan Johnson or, or Robert, I mean we'd never worked together and as soon as we got together it was obvious that A, we all liked each other which is very important when you have to spend as many hours together. Um, we just don't sleep together but everything else we do. <laughs> um, but you never know. <laughs> uh, so, you, so you do have to like each other. And, and B, we, we respected each other's work. And, um, and we've been having a lot of fun. Uh, we discuss everything. Everything can be discussed. It's not, I mean, doing a big Broadway musical is not. <laughs> it's not the same as writing a play and then handing it in and then the script, then the cast does it. I mean, it's, it's, it is like everyone's suggestions from everywhere. And you do have to have this core, which is the three of us, to understand each other, know what we're going for, filter out all those wonderful suggestions that come from everyone. Um, and so y trust is very important in, in the musical. Um, I'd never trust in a play, though. I, I, I feel a director in a play, if it's a play that, I, that is finished, and as you said, it's not a, if it's not that process kind of working, but it's a finished play, I don't trust nobody. I don't trust, don't touch that word. You know, when, it, when an actor says one of the famous things, that act, my character wouldn't say that. Well, you're playing the wrong character because this one does. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, actors will tell you the most bizarre things. Um, <laughs> the woman who played, who played the mother in the original production of Tort Song, uh, two nights before opening, refused to do the Big Widow speech at the end of the show, saying it means nothing. This speech means nothing. It's not how anybody feels. And the director said, fine. Then take three steps to the left, say this line. Four steps to the right, sit on the edge of the couch, say the rest of the speech, and then go out the door. And she did, and of course the audience was reduced to tears. She said, oh, I always knew that was a great speech. <laughs> um, I even had an actor uh, quit on me a couple of nights before opening, saying that he didn't have a role. Um, <laughs> I could have sworn I'd written it. There was one day when I had to tie it, but I read it. When I read it, there was a role. Um, so, so, you know, I think that, that a playwright can't be messed with, that you don't let somebody mess with your unless you put it up on stage and everybody's doing a great job and they're doing it just the way you want and it really eats it. Then you let them play with it. Okay, I'll listen, you know. Al, what do you think about that? Well, there are, um, there's a sharp division between two huge schools of directors. There are the 
directors who take the play and regard the play as a springboard for their work into the atmosphere. And uh, what's left of the play is barely recognizable. You'll have a stunning production sometimes, uh, visually blinding. And unfortunately, these productions uh, frequently get extraordinary reviews. And the director gets attention because you can't see anything but what he did or she did. Um, and then there is the school of directing that I support and teach, uh, which I've rank, frankly learned at the O'Neill, where Lloyd Richards charges us, you are there to serve the playwright. At least in that playwright's conference, that's what we're there for. And uh, I have always held that uh, truth to be self-evident. Uh, and though the play is being worked on in that process, uh, you and as the director and the actors are there to serve the playwright. And my feeling is that when the playwright is well served by the actors, by the designers, and particularly by the director who must collaborate with all of them and pull all of that together, then you have the most successful production. Uh, and frequently in that instance when the reviews come out, the director is not even mentioned because no one knows what he did. Uh, and I even say to my students, you leave your imprint, but hopefully not your fingerprints. Um, if you've done your job well, they don't quite know what you've done, except everything works. And you just have to get over the fact that when you read that wonderful review that praises the extraordinary performance and the magnificent script and the it's stunning production, that your name doesn't met, get mentioned in there, although you chose every one of those people and you pulled it all together. But uh, for instance, with this recent production of Robeson, uh, the, the joy of doing that was that when Avery and I went to work on it, uh, we never chose, we never even wanted to change a word of it. And right up to opening night, I was still hearing it from the producer about wanting 15 minutes out of it, as was Philip. And uh, I, there was no way in the world I was going to do that. I had no interest in taking 15 minutes out of it, never chose to even discuss it. Uh, if it was too long by the clock, then it was too long by the clock. But I did not feel that no one was leaving the theater. No one was failing to stand at the end and give it a three to five minute standing ovation. So. I felt that I had served the playwright. And when the director does his job well, I think that's what he does. Phil, do you have any comments on that? No, they, you know, they didn't touch the play. Uh, and I was very happy. Um, and I agree with Harold. If there is a problem, if people are walking out, unless the playwright's an idiot, you know, <laughs> then he could say there's something's wrong here. I'm not opposed to that. The thing that I'm opposed to is this notion that the collaboration is between the playwright and the director, which I just don't buy. I do <coughs> believe theater is a collaboration, but not the drama. I think the drama, the playwright collaborates with himself in a room by himself. And it's a very lonely and a very difficult thing to do, to write a play. It's extremely lonely. I think that's why a lot of playwrights drink heavily. <laughs> uh, I do. I, I, and, you know, a lot of writers have ended up uh, being alcoholics. I think that a lot of this comes out of this misunderstanding of improvisation, where they want to rewrite the play through improvisation, or whatever technique they use. But I must say that the Harold has directed three plays of mine, yes. and he's never touched them. And I've had other, I had a director once who hid the leading man in the play. You know, had him in shadows and coats up like this. And I kept wondering, what is he doing? He wanted them to follow his direction rather than the story. And that's, I think, you have to watch out for. I'm going to have to interrupt here because there are so many questions that are to be asked, and I, I would like to get to most of them. Uh, would you step right up, please? Okay. My name is Bill Goda. I'm from Columbia University Grad School. Uh, my question is for the playwrights. Uh, who are the heroes you write about and why? Weller. Well. <laughs> yes. Not the little question, the big question. Uh, that's a really big question. Um, <laughs> Take your time. I mean, to begin with, the idea that there's a hero is, is, is I think, kind of, for me, um, not, not really very applicable to my work. Um, I've written leading roles, but a hero in, 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 in terms of somebody who exemplifies, you know, morally admirable behavior or has a, a flaw worth, be, worth illuminating for the audience, that doesn't, that doesn't concern me. And I don't think, 
I don't see how I, I could ever even write somebody like that, living as I do now, knowing what I know about human nature. So I, I don't, I don't, I don't like really. Like to rephrase that, that for influence. Pardon? Would you like to rephrase hero for influence? Who influences you most? As a writer, you mean? Mm -hmm. Oh, not not nobody really. All right. <laughs> Next question. Come on. <laughs> My name is Deborah Savage, and I'm wondering why the panel feels women playwrights and women directors are so underrepresented in New York theater right now. And on this panel. And on this panel. <laughs> Where is Emily Mann? <laughs> Austin, do, you do you think they are? Does anybody? I, do, I, I, do. I, I do. You do? I do, and I think the reason is because the exact reasons that you think it is. That, uh, that produces wonder whether people will take direction from a woman director, whether, uh, whether uh, yeah, I mean, for all the worst reasons that you think, I think that's where they are. They're there. I've worked with several. I've enjoyed several more. Uh, they're there, but get them in New York. Get them, show their work showcased. Thank you. And what about women playwrights? They are not as underrepresented as women directors are, I don't think. I mean, um, playwrights of all sexes are underrepresented in New York right now. Uh, 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 but, um, but, the, but, the, uh, but they are as directors, and I think Harvey's exactly right, and it's disgusting. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, my name is Ginger Grace, and first of all, I would just like to thank you for the incredible sense of values and life all of you bring to the theater because it helps us so much every day and this is backtracking a little bit to an earlier question but as far as starting out in the theater I would like to ask Miss Dalrymple how you started out and managed to do every whoops everything everything write direct produce oh darling it's too long a story <laughs> <laughs> oh come on Jean. come on no. Out with it. No. <laughs> Come on. I'm Ann Smith, the true audience, the perfect audience. I love the theater. And this is directed to the directors. How do you deal with the big name star who feels he or she has more clout than the director? <laughs> <laughs> Why do we all look in one direction? Robert, would you get it? Um, deal with that. Um, I've worked with a lot of very big name stars, but I know, I, I've never had that problem. Um, I've never worked with any major movie star who has demanded anything more than any other actor in the cast. I, I, I don't say that, and I'm not just saying that as a kind of cover up, but it's true. I never have. I know, Austin, you've worked with some very famous people as well. I, I never, I've, I've had that problem with people who weren't named. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> but, but I've never had, I mean, you want to know about Elizabeth Taylor, is that what you mean? No, yeah. not at all. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she, was, she was a total ensemble, what? Replaced. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of a specific example where there were three directors because the stars, the, there was a male and female star, who just couldn't. couldn't. Be. I could what? name him, but I won't. Yeah, I know. I think we know. Yeah. How do you want to yeah, I've never had that difficulty either. I mean, Avery was Avery Brooks. Uh, absolutely no problem to direct. Uh, I go from him now to Esther Roll for the second time. A joy to direct. Uh, Jimmy Noble from uh, Benson. Uh, a joy to direct. I, no star I've directed has been difficult. I agree with Austin. It's the lesser ones that give you grief. Thank you very much. Try and tell much. you what the play is about. Austin, this, say a good word for Ms. Taylor. Oh, Elizabeth Taylor was a total... <sighs> she took direction, and she acted with everyone else. And at one point in the play, when, when some new people came into the play in very important roles after it had been on for a few months, and, I, and they brought all kinds of different things to the scene, she would just adjust in front of an audience to some new thing they would do. She would throw away an effect that she had created over several months and just go completely with, she was there. All the actors who ever acted in that production of The Little Foxes that we did just thought she was very alive 
to them on stage and very responsive and very sympathetic to them on stage and off. I mean, it's nothing, it's the opposite, you would think, of the cliché of an over an overbearing star. May I just back up and, and give a partial answer? just occurred to me, a partial answer. The only time I believe a, a star is difficult for the director is when, it, as it was in this instance, the star publicly declares that they do not need a director, that they would prefer not to have a director. Mm -hmm. I think if a star feels that they do not need direction, then no matter who the director is, that person has no job. It's impossible that the star might as well direct him or herself. Also, Thank by you. The way, I think these stories become so magnified because I they're so rare. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think so. <coughs> yes. I, I have a question for the playwrights. Uh, I realize that money is a prime issue, but uh, could you address the, the issue of uh, potentially good playwrights fleeing to film and television and uh, what needs to be done to encourage them to stay in the theater? I know from my my reaction, um, I mean, I didn't, uh, I'm only doing this because Robert asked me to uh, do legs. I was sort of through with theater because I was so sick of the New York critics. Um, you spend a year of your life alone in a room, tearing your heart out, writing something, I mean, specifically safe sex, um, writing something that, that comes from the incredible pain of losing hundreds of friends, and then they come in and say things like, well, if it was in a smaller theater, I'd give it a better review. Um, I think that uh, I know a lot of people in Hollywood that wouldn't come back to New York because of the critics. Um, it's not the audience. We love you all. We love the audiences. We love the feeling of having our work on stage. Um, it has nothing to do with the money. Don't believe that. It has to do with, it has to do with the fact that if you do a TV show, which is the worst you could do, right? Not so bad, trust me. Uh, you do a TV show <laughs> that you believe in, that you like. I mean, I did a thing for, for, um, for HBO, you know, where they didn't mess with me at all. They just let me, they gave me the money, said go do. I hired who I wanted, I did what I want. If it's the lowest rated show ever to show on television in its spot, um, your show would have to run on Broadway about 10 years sold out for as many people to see it. So you're communicating to huge numbers of people. Um, and if the critics come in and say it's awful, it doesn't matter, it's already been on the air. Um, it's already, your message has gotten out there. So it's very, very painful to be subject to somebody who might have had a bad dinner um, and come to the theater, you know, in a bad mood. I think that answers it very well, Harvey. My name is Pearl Levinson, and my question is addressed to the panel. Will ticket prices continue to escalate so that theater lovers will be priced out eventually? Yeah. <laughs> Thank God for the t theater development fund is all I can say to you. It just seems, uh, there, there seems to be no end to it. And for the half-price food. Can I we don't think that may change, though. I, I will jump in a little bit here. Please. I think, I think that's going to change. I think that it's going to seek its own level eventually, and I think that, that uh, rather than the theater, the audience being priced out of existence, the danger will first come where the theater will literally price itself out of existence. Before that happens, I think there will be a whole reassessment coming. I give it about five years. Other than TDF, have you any ideas of what you can do about ticket prices? Have you any thoughts do, about how you can bring them down, how you can bring ticket prices I, down? I don't think any of us have that power. It's the producers who have the power, and I, have I guess you, they... Have you tried to work with producers and theater owners oh, on yes, Broadway? Oh, yes, as recently as our most recent production. But uh, if you're charged a rental for the theater and you have an entire union staff of people, we had eight people for a one-man show, I mean, that you have to pay to watch television while the show is up because they have nothing to do. I mean, I, the unions I, are what are, are killing us. I had in my I mean, the, the labor unions. ten dollar tickets. I had to put in my contract, um, and we sold the uh, we sold the upper balcony for ten dollars. The unfortunate thing is, most people that needed those ten dollar seats couldn't walk the fifty five flights of stairs to get up there. <laughs> <laughs> but there are one or two producers that do have a reduced rate all the way down for the upper balcony where they have them, and they're being filmed. Yeah. 
so that people do want to walk up and, and if they're given the opportunity to see the theater. And, and I think That's that right. everybody has to uh, use their influence on, on seeing that the ticket price is lower and that there is a senior citizen and there is all kinds of, of merchandising for the theater that isn't being done to get them in. That's true. And I, I would just, one other quick thing. Uh, I, I would, although certainly we, t we hear about the unions and all the unions and all of that, and one, the unions say, no, it's the theater owners. But I think also there's another thing with, with shows that are dark. Uh, I must say, our beloved city of New York is not helping people. When, you, when the rental, when a theater is dark, the, the taxes go on and the taxes go up on landmark theaters, uh, whether they're dark or not, uh, without any, uh, any relief, tax relief, which again bounces over to all of the other people. So it's a very, very, complicated. very complicated, difficult, and wrenching situation, which I think will take care of itself because um, of just uh, the fact that it won't price itself out of existence because it must exist. And I think it's going to have to come to that before anything changes. I hope you're right. Yes. I'm C.A.R. Smith. I'm a character actor who has never, <laughs> never been asked to direct a damn thing. Um, Harold Scott, I respond tremendously to you, your description of how you direct. I was wondering, though, because of what you said to the man who first said, why don't you direct, what do you mean, I can't act? Would you, in your heart of hearts, say, still, let me see that next new terrific script, and yes, I'll get a leave of absence? As a matter of fact, Austin asked me when we were standing outside, and he asked me if I still act. I said, oh, no. And he said, if I had a role and offered it to you, would you do it? I said, if you direct it, yes. Ah. Uh, and I did. Uh, dragged myself out and he's doing Hamlet at Riverside Shakespeare now and two years ago I came out from hibernation and did Brutus at Riverside Shakespeare. It was an horrendous experience to go in and dredge up all that again. Uh, it's, acting is a very naked experience and therefore very painful and if you once fold all that up and put it away in Pandora's box down there, uh, it's very difficult to uh, to drag all that up again. And Brutus is not a role that you can get through without <laughs> opening it all like up. Me and do the third, the uh, chief gardener, Richard II. It's simple. You come and go off. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Come on. Uh, my name is David Bowles. I'm from the Hammerstein Center at Columbia. And uh, my question is about collaboration and what Michael said about if someone has an idea, just say no about your script. I'm curious if it's really that easy. Uh, and if a, a playwright says to one of the directors, absolutely not, if the directors take that for an answer, or you know, take no for an answer, or if uh, there is a way to solve that problem in collaboration. It seems that the people here on the panel get along awfully well, but I'm not sure if that's always the case. Can you maybe give us some clues for young playwrights who may run into a director and uh, who doesn't actually agree I'll with your play? I'll tell you what I would advise you to do. Run, <laughs> if, if that happens. If, if, if you say no to a director, about a request the director makes, however honestly intention that request may be on the part of the director, and you say, no, that is absolutely not what I want to express here, and that's not what the play is about or what the play is for, and the director still either just circumvents you or it continues to exert intolerable pressure, and get rid of the director, or run, take the play and go. But because there are too many even plays. Even a beginning playwright. That's right. It's yes. The first play. No, no I mean it. Because, particularly it if it's a first play, because then that'll be the first time you've ever been seen, and 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 uh, they'll they'll have a total misrepresentation of you. Go and get the play on somewhere else, or go. You, you know, don't let your, that be done to you. I mean, it's very seductive, but don't let it be done. Okay. Also, the, the most extreme right. arrogance. Is Asserted on a beginning playwright. And you yes. Have to it, reassert the most extreme arrogance back. Exactly. <laughs> also, we must. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Isabella, if I may just add something to that. Uh, there, there's also the. Uh, there's a, a new um, movement, for better or for worse, afoot uh, that does put, create situations where plays are workshopped, where the playwright goes in expecting. Uh, to have the play dramaturged at, at the O'Neill is one place. That's the first place I ever experienced it. Uh, and where the playwright is seeking collaboration. I'm working now with a playwright, Doris Paisley, on a new play called Tears of Rage, uh, which began in Philadelphia this summer in a two-week workshop. And she's now allowed us to do it at Rutgers. Uh, and she's flown in and worked with us there. And she has changed the script 
each time, uh, not at my insistence, but from what she has seen out of the work and input that she's got from me about things that I thought did and didn't work, but she certainly was free to say no. I, was, I wasn't demanding them. They were merely suggestions. Okay, I'm Nathaniel Nesmith, and I would like you to... speak up. I am, I'm Nathaniel Nesmith, and I would like to address my question to Michael Weller. I'm sort of concerned and curious as to how um, the idea came about for Spores of War. Was it your idea, or was it the second stage idea, because it was commissioned by them? And when you work in that type of process, where do, how, how do you get a director when, when something has been commissioned? Well, it, there's different ways. That now, in, 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 when, when you say it was commissioned by the second stage, that's, that's correct. But I, w I was going to write the play anyway. It's just they happened to come along and say, we'll pay you to do it for us. I, the last three plays I've written have been for commissions, but they were all plays I was going to write anyway. And basically, uh, th it comes about by them saying, do you have an idea in mind? And I say, yes, and I describe what it is. And, uh, and then they say, OK, that sounds good for our theater. We'll give you the money. Uh, now, in the case of this play, I wrote a bunch of drafts of it, about four or five drafts of it, and then I finally gave it to Austin. Actually, I've always, been wa I've always wanted to work with Austin in any capacity, as an actor, a director, anything. And when we were ma start making a short list of people to, to possibly direct this play, me and one of the producers, Carol Rothman of the Second Stage, were sitting in, uh, the, the, is it called Café Madeleine? Is that uh, somewhere very near the, uh, the, uh, the Chelsea Westside Theater, yes. is it? Yeah. yeah. And uh, we were having a drink and talking about the progress of the play and all this. And Austin walked in with somebody. I <laughs> said, my god, I mean, is it possible that this time around I'll be lucky? So uh, we got the play to him. It wasn't finished yet, but he, uh, he read it in the state it was in and said, this is an, a very interesting bunch of writing, but it's not a play, really. And he went on to explain what he meant by that. And he gave me a, a few very interesting, clear metaphors for something I'd overlooked. And as soon as I understood what he was getting at, I saw instantly where the play was. And then I sat down and I, I, I just wrote it. After, after about five years of trying various different ways of writing it as a non-play. Okay. I'm sorry that there isn't time for more questions. There is so much more to be asked and so much more to be answered. And all of these people on the panel today have been so knowledgeable and have been so kind to share their knowledge with us. This is the American Theatre Wing Seminars on Working in the Theatre, and I'm Isabel Stevenson. I'm president of the American Theatre Wing. The seminars are coming from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York, right here in the heart of Times Square on 42nd Street. Thank you for being here. I enjoyed the seminar just so much, and I hope that you did too. Thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah